You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Nothing is so challenging for urban communities as improving inter-ethnic and interracial human relations. For proof, you only have to look at the emotions revealed by the Amadou Diallo case in New York or the Michael Carpenter case here in Cincinnati. Unfortunately, for over two years, one of the primary human relations organizations in Cincinnati has struggled with internal issues as much as community issues. The Cincinnati Human Relations Commission, the CHRC, has been weakened over the last six to eight years by internal disputes, resulting in the resignation of a vast majority of the Board of Trustees and contributing to the early retirement of its director. Two months ago, the consultant team that delivered a report with a broad array of recommendations for the CHRC. I believe it is important to keep abreast of the developments with this agency. Arzell Nelson was a guest in February 1998 at the time of his retirement as the last director. Pat Gary and John Van Volkenberg, the consultants who wrote that recent report, were guests in January of this year. This morning, I am joined by Cecil Thomas the new interim acting director of the Cincinnati Human Relations Commission. Mr. Thomas served for 27 years as a Cincinnati police officer until he retired several weeks ago to assume the directorship of the Human Relations Commission. While on the police force, Mr. Thomas served as the president of the Sentinel Police Association, an organization for African-American police officers. Mr. Thomas, welcome uh, to Newsmakers. Glad to be here. Why, after 27 years, leave, obviously, a career that you know, you had committed a huge chunk of your life <laughs> to, to take on this particular challenge. Well, you know, uh, 27 years as a police officer uh, was 27 years of human relations, dealing with the uh, community at large, uh, not only locking up crime uh, subjects that are violated the law, you also spend a lot of time, you know, uh, mediating situations, working out problems with individuals and groups, and uh, uh, after 27 years, I, I thought it was about time to uh, move on to something else. Why this? Um, you know, is CHRC something that you had been involved with in the past, that you knew about real well? Was, uh, what was your relationship with well, the organization? I really didn't have a relationship with CHRC other than I can recall back in the 70s when I challenged the police agency concerning the uh, hiring and uh, promoting of African Americans in the police force. And you took that to court, I right? I took that to court and, right. and it was mediated and uh, a consent decree agreement was worked out between uh, the city and uh, myself and uh, it was a class action complaint. Now, CHRC played a, uh, an important role in assisting with that and they have been involved in uh, human rights issues. Uh, within the agency, within the police agency, within the city itself, all those years, and and uh, it's kind of much what I was doing as a Sentinel president. Go ahead, I didn't yeah. want to catch you well, off there. You know, with uh, a lot of the things I was doing as a Sentinel president was dealing with uh, uh, interacting between government and the community. You know, the the fact that so often, as I mentioned in the in the intro here, a lot of the emotion are sort of laid bare around police action. Mm -hmm. Is the fact that you are a former uh, mm -hmm. police officer now, is that going to be a positive asset in this job? Do you think that has a direct significance here? Well, I think it does simply because uh, one of the major issues that, that uh, has conf confronted this city for many years is the relationship between the police and the community. Uh, as a former police officer, I do understand both sides of the issue. I can, un I can, I can identify with a police officer who's walking up uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning at a traffic stop in a car with individuals in it not knowing what uh, he's walking up on. I can identify with what's going through his mind. So I can understand his side of the, of the uh, issue uh, when he acts out the, that situation. And I also can understand from a citizen's standpoint that the citizen don't really understand what an officer does, uh, why he maybe have placed his hand on his weapon. They don't understand that. They, and being able to see it from both ends puts me in a, in a situation where I Do you think the CHRC it. ought to have some direct role in 
mediating, I mean, we're talking, mm -hmm. you were talking as an individual there. Should the CHRC, though, be doing some sort of programming, for example, to help citizens understand police or police understand citizens' perspective? Well, yeah, most definitely, simply because <clears throat> the major, one of the, I've seen over the years, is one of the major problems that create bad police community relations is a lack of understanding on both ends. Uh, the citizen does not understand the police, and the police does not understand the citizen. Now, uh, on a, what I'm looking at at this particular point is bringing that issue to the forefront by bringing those two sides to the table together. Uh, I'm looking at a cable te television network to uh, assist in bringing the, the citizen's viewpoint and the police viewpoint right to the table and let them talk about it. Our Citizens Police Academy is an excellent tool. Uh, I, everybody that has went through that academy has said, I never really knew how police officers did their Citizens job. Police Academy, this mm -hmm. is something that already exists? This, is, this exists. Who runs it? Uh, it's, it's ran by the police academy. Uh, okay. I believe it might be the Citizens Advisory Committee okay. that has something to do with that. The only problem with the Citizens Police Academy, it only reaches a few citizens. What we need to do is reach the masses of citizens. Okay. Uh, I don't want to get off on mm -hmm. too many possibilities mm -hmm. here, but uh, CHRC is an organization that has gone through a period of some challenges. Yes. And what do you see? You've been there for about three weeks now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How do you assess the situation and what are your immediate priorities? Well, you, my first, <clears throat> first assessment was that it needed a director. It needed some direction. Uh, my first priority was to first of all, uh, deal with the internal issues that had developed uh, because of lack of a director and lack of leadership. What are some of those? Well, the, 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 the fire that brought those employees that are there now, the fire that they had was somewhat, the flame was just about out. They were kind of just going through the motions every day. There was really no, no, no uh, 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 vision, no mission statement of any real clear direction uh, but they were they were there and it just wasn't any any life there okay. well I, my first uh, direction was to bring that life back and wake the folks up and get everybody moving again and, and the way you do that is, is you instill your you, you impart yourself into them you, you give them vision you give them direction what about on the structural the board level particularly uh, you mentioned mentioned uh, a lack of a sense of mission mm -hmm. a clear mission maybe mm -hmm. Uh, that's something that really is a, a board level sort of responsibility. Right. Where do you stand on that? Well, the board that, uh, uh, that I did inherit, uh, when I looked at what we were doing, there were a lot of things. CHRC had begun to get too broad in trying to do too many different things uh, in too many different areas. And when you do that, you only can give a little bit of time with the staff you have to, to all of those different areas. Uh, one of my objectives and goals is to kind of narrow us down to let's focus on these is areas here. If this is what council wants, if they want good uh, uh, police community relations issues dealt with, let's focus there and let's trim it down to maybe three or four issues and not all these broad issues that we were working on. In that report that was done by Pat Gary and uh, Jonathan Volkenberg, one of the things that they cited very clearly in that report was that they put a lot of blame on city council. They said city council had not given CHRC the support it needed, given mm -hmm. it the mandate, and backed it up. Where do you, and in fact, as I understand it, uh, at that time, this was back in January when mm -hmm. they were on the show, mm -hmm. there was no new, uh, CHRC didn't have a, a, needed to renew a contract. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand with that? Where do you stand with the city council? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been meeting with each council member and introducing who I am and the goals and directions that I feel that CHRC should be going. Uh, and uh, in meeting with them, I get a feel of exactly what they're looking for. The city council had become disconnected from CHRC, just as the community had become disconnected from CHRC. And what I've uh, looked at is, we've got to reconnect everybody up and everybody get on the same page. Uh, it was very easy for council to feel the way they feel, felt simply because there was no direction. There was no, no, no uh, uh, set 
goals and, and, and scope of services other than what they felt the uh, commission should be doing. And if you got nine members all having different ideas as to what the commission should be doing, now you're gonna have chaos. So what we need to do is sit down with each council member and, and, and them as a whole and direct it, give some direction. One of the things that that report, the January report, also said that CHRC is a private not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. It is not a city agency in that's right. Yes. The traditional sense. It's not a government unit. It's a private not-for-profit that gets its support from city. Mm -hmm. Okay. They said that maybe before a new contract was signed, an RFP should be developed, request for proposal, mm -hmm. where the city could say, this is what we want mm -hmm. a human relations entity to mm -hmm. do. And mm -hmm. then put that out and let a variety of potential organizations bid on that. What, how do you feel about that? Well, I, the, I, have, I have a real problem with that. For instance, let me give you an example. We have uh, uh, what is called CRMs, uh, Citizen um, uh, Monitors. Uh, I can't think of it. It's Citizen... Yeah, it doesn't make it They're CRM. monitors, CRMs. They're monitors. Now, <clears throat> Those, if those monitors were under a, these are private citizens that go into a neighborhood where there's a, there's been a, a, a hostile, a, host, a, ho, a horrible situation just occurred. A policeman just shot and killed somebody. The, na the neighborhood's upset. Well, you send the CRMs in to, to try to calm people down. Well, when you do that, I have a problem with that simply because if they're not under some, com some guidance coming from within the city services, you're sending citizens into a hostile environment with the intent of thinking that they're going to calm the situation down. It's not going to, at some point, something's going to happen where citizens are going to get hurt. So you think that the, the agency contracted for human relations services has to be inside City Hall, has to be semi part exactly. of the city government? Yeah, and see, what I envision CHRC as is uh, tapping into the resources of all these other agencies that are out there and uh, you don't want to divide your your services all over the city uh, scattered every which way then you lose any centralized control of what's going on and you don't want to bring a financial uh, aspect into the equation you don't want to do that you don't want to have people uh, uh, saying well the city is paying us this much money to do this. Uh, which, where are we going to send that service? You know, you know back when uh, CHRC was originally created back in 1943 as the Mayor's Friendly Relations Commission and then later in the 50s, mm -hmm. CHRC, um, it was one of the few human relations organizations in the community. Now there are lots that have a, a lot of different focus. There's organizations that, to focus on the, the rights of the disabled, mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. uh, Urban Appalachian Council. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. does that allow CHRC to focus in a way maybe it did in the past? Is and and therefore, but also mean you have to develop a different kind of relationship with these other organizations? Well, I had a I had uh, the handicap organization in my office. Uh, we met uh, last Friday, and they had been totally left out of any equation in, in terms of, of uh, the relationship between the city and the handicap organizations. Uh, Alicia Reese had to be the one to come on council and say, hey, we need to sh straighten up our entryways to the, for the handicap. They basically were saying that they just didn't have a voice anymore because of all the, the uh, uh, everyone trying to decide what should CHRC be focusing on. Their CHRC has to be the voice for government uh, uh, and for the community as far as all the different kinds of groups, uh, diverse groups. The Hispanics, we've got a growing Hispanic population. Uh, and in my conversation with that organization, they've got issues with the police that don't even come to the forefront. I think we need to back up here for a second because I, I do want, uh, so there's an organization that speaks for the Hispanic community. Yes. Is that what you, you mm -hmm. know, one of the things that maybe as a police officer being out there on the streets, in the neighborhoods, I think for a lot of Cincinnatians the assumption is 
the way I like to put it is diversity comes in this city in two colors and one language. Mm. But in fact, <laughs> would you yeah. say there's a lot more diversity here than, than is normally recognized? Dr. Richardson, uh, uh, Ed Richardson, I met with him and he, he did a, a phenomenal amount of research on the different diverse cultures and, and, and uh, ethnic groups that are living in Cincinnati. There were over 130 of them that are living in Cincinnati that uh, council doesn't even know about. Cincinnati is no longer looked at as just black and white. It's, it's an enormous amount of different organizations and groups of people here. And the role of my commission is to reach out and, and, and to connect up with all of these folk to let them know that there is a voice at city government that could speak for them on issues, whatever they may be. We not be, may not be able to resolve that issue, but at least we can say, okay, well, here's the resource that I can connect you up with. If it's NCCJ, if it's- uh, Which is National Conference of Community Injustice. Exactly, uh, the American Federation of, of Jewish, uh, I believe that's one- Services. Of, you know, there's, there's a phenomenal amount of groups, you know, out there that we can connect them up to, but- So you can be the network that, that lets people exactly get connected. we can be under all under one umbrella is what I'm envisioning one of the things right now your title and I'm not sure I've saw it mm -hmm. I, in print I've seen it as interim but when you I got mm -hmm. your bio it said acting okay that means the same thing Talk I guess thing. yes um, we, do you, <laughs> do you <laughs> expect to become the full-time permanent director and that's, if so how's that going to happen that's going to be up to the board I'm going to I can't even think about allowing myself to focus in that direction. I got a job to do, and uh, as I told council, I do not really have time to, to bicker back and forth over where the commission is going to be tomorrow. My job is to, is to bring a vision, to uh, bring goals and objectives, and put those, uh, all of that into place, and get the commission back to the people where it belongs. And we have just uh, less than two minutes to go here. Mm -hmm. um, on a case like the Michael Carpenter case, mm -hmm. if CHRC is hitting on all cylinders, mm -hmm. and doing what it, you think it ought to do, what the board thinks it ought to do, what would it do in a situation like that? An incident takes place, what would it do? The, the, the first major response of CHRC is to go and get a heartbeat, uh, get a pulse of the, of the community, to get a pulse of the police agency, and find out just exactly what people are feeling. Once we've done that, then we can kind of uh, do our own little uh, 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 investigation, so to speak, and report to council just exactly what the heartbeat of the community is. Uh, do we need to uh, uh, shore up uh, that whole issue? But that's the whole objective, is to get in and, and, and find out just what people are feeling. Well, good luck important organization and I look forward to having you back on the show in the future. Thank you. Stay tuned. Next Saturday, area public schools will celebrate their contribution to the community. The organizers will be here right after the break. Welcome back. This coming Saturday, 39 school districts from all over Southwest Ohio and Northern Kentucky will gather at the Cincinnati Convention Center for their Expo of Excellence. I am joined this morning by two of the Expo's organizers. Jenny Walters is the chairperson of the Expo, Brewster Rhodes, who has been involved with area public schools in an incredible variety of ways, and you can tell from his t-shirt he's part of Parents for Public Schools is also one of the organizers. Uh, welcome to Newsmakers. Brewster, welcome back. You've been here a bunch of times. <laughs> Wearing nice a lot of you. different hats. That's right. Um, Jenny, the Expo, it's been around, this is the third year, That's but right. what really is it and what's the goal here? I think the real goal of the Expo and Public Education Week, which follows the Expo every year, is to give schools a chance to showcase and highlight to their local communities and the region, some of the great practices, programs, and outstanding student performances, everything that exists in a school that is wonderful to showcase that to their communities. Brewster, how's that going to be done? I mean, concretely, if somebody visits the, uh, the, the expo, what do they see? What do they experience? Well, Dan, they, they walk into the convention center 
and see 220 exhibits from schools, as you said, throughout the, the metropolitan region, showing off their best practices, things that really work. They'll see four stages of live student performances going from 10 until 5 throughout the course of the day. Um, there'll be exhibits from nonprofit partners like Crowns to Computers or uh, uh, Cincinnati Youth Collaborative, folks who are involved in helping to support and augment the work of our teachers and administrators in our school districts. So there'll be a lot of things happening constantly. It, uh, plus, and this is extremely exciting, we have for the first time uh, a job fair for educators, for, edu for school districts. Right, I was going to raise that. Concretely, what does that mean? We have 28 school districts, each of which will have a booth with their personnel or human resources directors and their staff present to share information with interested people about what kind of job opportunities are available, whether it's for teachers, for uh, custodial staff, or for clerical folks, substitutes. So here's an opportunity to find out what jobs are available in school districts throughout the region. Okay, so a real practical implication. Yes. A lot of people coming out of uh, undergrad who are still looking for that first teaching job mm -hmm, exactly. or or people who may be interested in going back to teaching after they've been out doing something else, somebody right. like me. And uh, it's actually, it's more than teachers. I right. Mean, there I, are opportunities right. for, from food service workers to custodians. Right. Um, this was, the educators throughout this region are a prime audience for us, in addition to parents and students and just the general community. But we wanted to provide them with more opportunities. Let, such let's as talk about fair. that general community. I can see where parents might go, teachers might go, administrators might go. Mm -hmm. Okay, my kids are graduated from college. Mm -hmm. I don't have kids in the schools anymore. Why would I go? Well, I think it's just an exciting event to come down and see where your tax dollars and how they're being used, what they're being used for. A lot of people don't have this type of opportunity. It's a free event to come down and witness firsthand the power of public education. And I still think um, with the successes of the schools that we have in the area, school levies are still being passed, that people still support our schools. And they like to know what's going on. Um, we had, especially last year, we had an increase in senior citizens that attended the event because they were just interested in coming out and not just seeing their grandkids, but just seeing how the schools were growing, improving, and doing better. So, Brewster, I mean, we, we've, Jenny's talking, making references, you made references to it. When you say, schools will demonstrate best practices. Give me a concrete example, something that you are looking forward to actually seeing a school do. Um, well, Jenny, maybe we can talk about some specific ex uh, uh, exhibits, but some, some schools will have a, um, a special science program that is something they developed uh, based on their own experience as teachers, administrators, that has proven that it can increase uh, proficiency test scores for uh, ninth graders in science, for example, and it's unique. Uh, not that they patented the thing, but they right. developed a curriculum that really works, and they are sharing that through this expo with educators throughout the region. So one of the neat things about the expo is that teachers can come and find out the best ways of teaching their, in their field, things that, uh, pro projects that really work, and steal those ideas and put them into practice in their own school. So that's a particularly unique thing about yeah, it. Yeah, and right. so often we talk about with schools, gee, this curriculum comes from the state or comes from someplace. What you're saying is some of the best curriculum comes from the grassroots, those right. teachers working with their students. That's going to be. Um, exactly. Is there, was there a project last year or one that you know is coming up this year uh, that, you, that you yourself or think would be the one that you'd really want to go see? I think the one that I'm always particularly interested in is the, one, the robotics one. Um, that comes from Northwest schools where the kids themselves have developed robots as part of their science curriculum um, to learn more about mechanics and that sort of thing. Um, I think the thing that's unique about all of these projects is that they're hands-on mm -hmm. and so many times we feel like we're just learning from the book and what these teachers and students have done is they have developed these practices and these projects that allow kids to get in there with their hands and to do things that are interactive to help them learn better. All kids learn differently, and I think we're always looking for new ways to meet every child's need. And I think all of these practices that will be de demonstrated that day will, will show you that, will show you that whether it's a special needs student or a gifted student or just your regular student, there's something there for everybody. And there'll be gain. that whole variety right. of special needs That's kids. That's right, uh, it's across the board. Right. And the educators recognize the need to showcase across the board, and we get that every year. Uh, Dan, we're also uh, um, having for the first time you, uh, workshops that are sponsored by and run by universities within the greater mm -hmm. Cincinnati area. The, there are free workshops open to, the, to, to parents and to educators about how to get your child into college, how to help finance your child's college education, 
uh, trends in teacher education that are happening these days. So and they'll be happening throughout the course of the day. So, so all sorts of things on all sorts of levels. Absolutely. Right. Good luck. Let's reinforce the information. It's next Saturday, April the 1st, 2000 at the Cincinnati Convention Center. It's free from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you for being here this thank morning. You. And thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week, I'll be joined by a state legislator from Lima, Ohio, who thinks parents who buy the, all those clothes and athletic shoes for their kids every August just before they go back to school deserve a sales tax holiday. Good idea or political trick? Tune in and make up your own mind. Have a good week.